The Hebrew uh, preacher today, as we hear from uh, Hebrews, speaks about Jesus holding his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Jesus is consequently able to, for all time, save those who approach God through him, since he lives to make intercessions for them. And then he goes on to say that it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Up to this point, the Hebrew preacher is talking about Jesus who is greater than Moses, greater than angels, greater than the Aaronic line of uh, priests. And in all of this, the interesting word to sum all of that up is the incarnation. Jesus is born uh, through the Virgin Mary, incarnate by the Holy Ghost. He lives as a human being here on earth. He goes through life, all the sufferings, all the joys, all of it. And then he's eventually hung on the cross. He dies and he's buried, and then he's raised to life again, and he ascends into heaven. The entirety of what the Hebrew preacher is talking about right now is the incarnation. So, it is fitting for the incarnation to have happened. The key word there for us today is fittingness. So, the question goes this way. Why did Jesus have to do all of this? Why did God have to give his one and only begotten son to the world? Why did Jesus have to become a human being? Why did he have to die? I mean, could not all of humanity have been saved through another means? Perhaps a less gross means, a less sadistic means. Remember again, Jesus literally had to hang on a cross and die. The simple answer is yes. Perhaps so, God could have snapped his fingers and all of humanity would have been saved. God could have waved a wand and everything would have been forgotten and everything restored. After all, he is omniscient and omnipotent. He can do all things as accords his nature and his being. But the answer to the first three questions, why did Jesus have to do all of this? Why did God have to give his one and only begotten son? Why did Jesus have to become a human? Why did he have to die? The question, or rather the answer to those questions, can be summed up in this word, fittingness. It was fitting that Jesus did all of this. It was fitting that God gave his one and only begotten son. It was fitting that Jesus became incarnate. It was fitting that Jesus died. It was fitting that he rose again. It's very fitting that he's now seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercessions for us. In essence, it is fitting that Jesus became incarnate. I guess we can ask, what does it mean to be fitting? Well, one way to think about fittingness is necessity. But that's not what we're talking about here. I guess a better word would be appropriate. I'll give you an example. I got to church this morning, as most of us did, uh, riding in a vehicle. Now, I could have probably walked or trekked for about an hour and a half from East Sherman Road through here. Um, but it's more appropriate to drive a car. I could have ridden a horse and galloped all the way. You could have seen me on the way, and you would have waved at me. But then you would have thought, huh, interesting. But it's more fitting that I'm in a car. And so, while it was not necessary for Jesus to be incarnate, it was very fitting, very appropriate. I was about to say very demure. <laughs> <laughs> On a deeper level, the incarnation shows that God holds no animosity towards human beings. I'm going to go back one second. Why was it fitting that the incarnation happened. This is going to be a little heady, but stay with me, and I think this is very appropriate for our faith. Well, first of all, the incarnation shows the highest level of love that could ever be shown. For through the incarnation, humanity was incarcerated uh, by its sin, 
or rather, when humanity fell and was incarcerated by its sin and disobedience and plagued with guilt uh, by its offense to God, the incarnation showed us unfettered proof of the loving nature of God who desires and who craves communion with us. In other words, a child offends the parent and the child feels guilty and runs away, goes to hide in the room, goes to hide under a blanket. The parent comes into the room with a cake and says, it's okay, you'll do better next time, and removes the blanket and gives the cake. I guess in this illustration, Jesus would be the cake. But then, the giving of God's Son to humanity shows this unfettered display of love. What better way is there to show love than the act of giving, the act of sacrifice? A lover gives to his beloved. A beloved receives from the beloved. This act of giving and receiving then becomes the bond of love between the lover and the beloved. On a deeper level, this act of incarnation shows that God holds no animosity towards humanity. This is different from what we sometimes hear that, you know, God is angry with humanity and uh, has to be appeased. You know, he's a sadistic being that demands the blood of his own son in order to forgive. No, the incarnation speaks in direct opposition to this view of a hostile God. Rather, the incarnation shows a God who holds no anger towards his creation. God gave his only begotten son out of love, not out of anger. God loves you. God desires a relationship with you and with me. In other words, receive that love, accept that love, don't run away from it. Draw close. Approach. Secondly, the incarnation was fitting because those who were far away could now be drawn close. We who were once lost have now seen a great beacon of light through the incarnation. And thus, relationship with the creator can be restored and has been restored. For you see, while God has us no ill feelings towards us, um, our relationship with him was broken through our fault, through our own grievous fault, through our own most grievous fault, as we would usually say sometimes. And of course, this breaking in relationship does not bode well for humanity at all. It never does, never has, and never will be good for us, this break in relationship with God. I mean, it is like a sheep that is sort of without a compass. It is like Peter drowning without a life jacket. It is like blind Bartimaeus in darkness, screaming for help. That's what the break in relationship with God looks like. But then, the incarnation becomes our compass to follow. It becomes the lifeline to hold on to. It becomes the beacon of light to navigate towards. This incarnation was fitting for being the medium to draw us closer to God. Thirdly, the incarnation was fitting because it showed us how to commune with God. Whereas humanity in our foolish desires and our endeavors uh, to be like God succumbed to pride and disobedience, Christ through his incarnation teaches us how to relate to God through his humility and obedience. The height of this we see when we kneel at the foot of the cross, when we watch Christ's spirit side drip with water and blood. We see how he bears all the pain, all the mockings of the world, all the hatred of humanity, all of it in humble and obedient service to God. And thus, we also see how he serves humanity in the same way. Though Christ was equal to God, Paul would say to the Philippians, he did not consider this equality something to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself in humble obedience to God, and he died. Therefore, God raised him up and gave him a name that is greater than every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. 
we too are called to this kind of humility and obedience as we serve God wholeheartedly. We're also called to serve our neighbors as well wholeheartedly. Because Christ gave himself wholly and totally, we too are called to give ourselves wholly and totally in loving devotion to God and to those around us. Doesn't matter if you're voting red or voting blue, this is what we're called to do, to serve. How have we been selfish? How have we thought of ourselves rather than others? How have we denied others of service? Let us look to Christ and follow in his footsteps. Fourthly, the incarnation was fitting because it made purpose out of pain, out of pain and out of suffering. It made, it made purpose out of sacrifice. You see, on our own in this world, it is painful to go through life. On our own in this world, it looks like it's just chance and, you know, little things happening by themselves. It's a narcissistic world. It's sometimes it feels like it's devoid of any meaning. But you see, through the incarnation, because Christ, who is both God and man, suffered in this life as a human being, our sufferings are not devoid of meaning. Rather, our sufferings and sacrifices hold weight. What is it that you might be going through in your life? What pains and sufferings are you sort of trudging towards right now? What heartbreaks and traumas have you dealt with? What betrayals have come your way? Difficulties perhaps raising kids, perhaps schoolwork or a stressful job. Maybe you're trying to plan your budget. All of it has meaning. Even our sicknesses and our pains, all of it has meaning. This life is meaningful. It is, it really is. And that's because the Son of God came into this life as a human being and lived and died as one of us. Our pains and our sufferings hold meaning. Lastly, the incarnation was fitting because it brought about dignity of the human status. Whereas we can classify human beings as the highest at the apex of uh, the animal uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, scheme, we still might be considered as just animals. But the Son of God, in his incarnation, has raised humanity above that into a status of real profound dignity. First of all, through salvation. You see, humanity was invited and brought into the salvific act because Jesus, as human, saved the world. In other words, Jesus, who is Savior, did not have a Savior's complex. That's quite interesting. He did not just snap his fingers and we were saved. He didn't just write a check and flung it to people to you know, get there. He didn't just impose his idea of how to save people on others. No. He got down into the dirt, became one of us, walked with us, endured, suffered, felt everything we feel, then saved us through all that pain. He raised us into a bigger level of dignity. Secondly, his sacrifice then becomes the overarching sacrifice through which we present ourselves to God. In other words, as I said previously, our lives have profound meaning. Are you about to give to the church? Before now, it could have just been a little check, you know, to be forgotten maybe who knows, six months from now. We won't remember that it was you who gave the check. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, because of the incarnation, that act becomes a divine act. It becomes a God act because it is now under the umbrella of Christ's sacrificial act. Are you trying to love your spouse? That's cool, that's fine. Perhaps others love their spouses way better than you. <laughs> but the way you do yours, because it is summed up in the act of what Christ has done, becomes profound, becomes godlike. Are you working? Are you schooling? Are you sick? Again, I've already said this before, but I'm trying to show us 
the dignity through, through which the incarnation has raised us to. Everything we do now becomes godlike. And that is because of the incarnation. That is because of the fittingness of the incarnation. So, was it necessary? Perhaps no. Was it appropriate? Very, very yes. Like, heck yes. And so we give thanks to God because he deemed it appropriate to send his one and only son. We give thanks to Jesus because he deemed it appropriate to empty himself and to be humble enough to obey the Father. We give thanks to the Holy Ghost because through his power, he effects Christ's sacrifice in our lives so that all that we do now is raised to God-likeness. Glory be to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>